story that goes along with this as well. Uh, so my understanding was that uh, Terry Davis was, uh, I want to say he was a very smart individual. I think he was an MIT graduate. Um, he was an atheist and he also suffered from manic depression and had been in and out of institutions, or at least that's my understanding. And uh, during one of these spells that he had, he believes that God spoke to him and told him to build God's official temple in the form of an operating system, which was to be called Temple OS. And apparently God was quite specific about what his temple had to have. For example, God said, let the size of the screen be 640 by 480 pixels. Apparently, God likes very low resolution things. <laughs> Needs an upgrade, I think. Uh, only 16 colors and a singular audio voice, because why would you need to talk to anybody but God, of course? Um, now, no network, because the only person you ever need to talk to is God, and he doesn't need a network. Uh, and one address space. One address space. Not one address space for program, one address space for everything to share. That's interesting. Everything has kernel privilege. Everything. There's no distinction between unprivileged and privileged code, which means that user programs can directly access kernel functions and kernel data structures and hardware. And this is why, on a technical level, this is a very, very interesting operating system. Uh, think about all of the work that has to be done for implementation of system calls. Think about all of the extra computation that actually goes down when you want to write to a file. You have to raise that exception. The kernel has to stop executing your code to handle the exception. It's a lot of extra work. All of that overhead from a computational but also a coding perspective doesn't exist in this OS. Doesn't exist. So that's pretty cool too. Uh, other than that, you might think that this operating system is fairly simple. No, it has full preemptive concurrency. Uh, it supports multiple cores. It has all of those lovely things but just no separation between kernel and user programs, which actually makes it very, very interesting. Um, now, the operating system is limited, obviously, because who's going to write programs for this? Nobody, except this guy here. Uh, but he did decide that um, he had to make his own file system as well. And since you know you partition a file system, he called his file system the Red Sea, so you part the Red Sea. And regular C wasn't good enough, so he made his own C language called Holy C. And so this was actually written in Holy C, not regular C. 
I know it's silly and you're laughing, but there are some very interesting people out there, okay? Uh, there is also an oracle that lets you talk to God, I suppose. Maybe it does. I don't know. I haven't used it. Um, and it's open source, so if you want to see the source code to this lovely beast, I think it's not that bad in size. It's only like 127,000 lines, so it's not that much. Um, you can download it, you can play with it, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, it's very simplistic, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, Terry Davis is no longer developing it because Terry Davis is dead. Um, I believe he died, was it last year, last summer? And it's not clear if it was suicide or he was having one of these states and he accidentally got hit by a train. Um, but either way, he is no longer with us. If you are looking up this individual, um, please be aware that he's highly offensive. He has a lot of rants on YouTube, which he took down due to people not liking him. And he was aware that people didn't like his rants, so he did take them down shortly before his death. But some people have put them back up again. I'm warning you, he offends everybody. If you think the Trump supporters are bad, you haven't seen anything yet. Um, so <laughs> I'm giving you that as a warning. You can look them up in your own rest. So what does Temple of Us look like? There you go. Looks like a lovely Commodore 64, something that I would have used in the 80s circa 2013 though. So he's got all kinds of uh, programs here. You can see actually here's output from the kernel right in the US. So you can know exactly what's going on while you're doing it. And his programs, obviously it's a biblically themed operating system. So instead of calling his digital keyboard, you know, piano, he called it psalmody. Uh, and he's got some games. There's, uh, he likes guns. Uh, so he's got all kinds of shooting games. He's got this guy in a game called Lensisless, Big Guns, The Dead. Yeah. Seems to go together. So that is Temple OS. Now, if you're thinking, wow, this guy's, you've told us now about two crazy people in computer science. Surely there's no more, oh, you don't even know the half of it. Some of the smartest people have some of the quirkiest attitudes. So there is a, um, a famous supercomputer guy uh, by the name of Seymour Cray, who is behind the Cray Supercomputer Company. And I lived with his niece for a while in California. And she told me stories about her uncle digging tunnels under his house and talking with dwarves and elves underneath his... Yeah. Some of the smartest people are also some of the quirkiest. That's not a diss, just a statement. <laughs> All right, so. We have a couple things to do today. So first off, I want to finish our wrap up slides, which is just finishing going over the uh, virtual machine stuff. And then we will talk about the final exam, which I know is what you actually want to hear about, you know, because exams are worth so much uh, and so on. But let's finish this and then we'll go on to final exam review. So we were talking about virtual machines. And remember that a virtual machine, this literally a simulated computer that we are running on top of a different piece of hardware and it lets us run guest operating systems on top of other OSs. And I'm sure you have used them. In fact, I know you have because you've taken this course and I presume that you have done the assignments. And if you've done the assignments, then you've used a virtual machine because even though it is a very simple one, that's what Sys161 is, is a very basic form of a virtual machine. Uh, if you've ever used anything like VMware or VirtualBox, guess what? Those are hypervisors in which we run virtual machines. So we were talking before there are two different, these hypervisors, they are actually what's going to create and manage each of the virtual machines and there are two forms of them. There's the type one hypervisor which is actually going to run on the bare hardware. And in effect, the type one hypervisor is an operating system of its own. And then the type two hypervisor, which most of us have experience with, 
is running on top of the host operating system as a user program, so without privilege. And then our guest operating systems are going to run on top of that in also user privilege. Now, for the type 2 hypervisor, it's not terribly exciting. Essentially, we're going to be catching all of the instructions we issue inside of the type 2 hypervisor and then translating them to native machine code. And if we get something like a system call in the type 2 hypervisor, then we're going to be like, oh, so you want me to actually run one of these system calls on the host operating system. So there's an amount of translation that goes on there. But the type 1 hypervisor has some interesting problems because the type 1 hypervisor is going to be running on the bare metal, which means it runs with privilege, but all of the guest operating systems aren't. And how are you going to differentiate between the user program trying to execute a privilege instruction and the operating system trying to execute a privilege instruction, which it should be allowed to do? Um, and that's actually a big thing with virtual machines, is how do you distinguish these privileges? And the solution is actually quite simple. And we've told you that there's only two levels of privilege, privilege and unprivilege, but that's actually a total lie. Um, and in fact, Intel chips have had four levels of privilege for a very long time. We've simply not used the others because we haven't needed to. So what they do to solve this privilege problem is they still let the type 1 hypervisor execute with full privilege and the user programs are still going to execute with no privilege but the guest operating system is now going to run with one of these intermediate levels of privilege and now we can actually distinguish between the user programs trying to execute a privilege instruction and the OS trying to execute a privilege instruction and we can stop the user program but permit the operating system from to do so. So that's kind of cool. Now, the other thing that's interesting is when you have all of these virtual machines, they all believe that they're the only one in existence. So they believe that 100% of the memory is theirs. And if you have two virtual machines that both are getting direct access to physical memory uh, through the Type 1 hypervisor, then that would mean that both of the VMs, both of the guest operating systems, would be trying to use the same range of physical memory. And that can actually cause a pretty big problem because you can get collisions in the page tables. Um, now how do we solve that? Well what it means is, in order to solve this, the Type 1 hypervisor actually has to offer uh, memory management to the guest operating system. So what it does is the Type 1 hypervisor presents RAM uh, as virtual addresses to guest operating systems. And the hypervisor is actually going to have what's known as a shadow page table, which is going to map between the fake addresses it gives to the guest OS to the actual real physical memory. And that way, the hypervisor can make sure that the two guest operating systems will never have a collision. But this in itself is a problem because the MMU doesn't know about the shadow page table. The MMU only knows about the guest operating system's page tables, which means that the hypervisor has to be involved with every single address translation. And this is one of the big reasons why these virtual machines weren't really used until about 10, 15 years ago is because of the added overhead of having a hypervisor do all of your address translations for you. And the solution actually came from the Nehalem architecture. So that's the first generation of the i7s. They actually built into their MMU support for extended page tables, i.e. support for hardware address translations with the shadow page table. So now the type 1 hypervisor doesn't actually have to do the address translations at all. However, it's not off the hook completely. Uh, because now, what if it's not in the TLB? You're going to have to go to the hypervisor to get it to update the TLB, and what if we change OS's? So if you have a machine where only one OS can technically run at a time, you do a world switch, 
not a context switch, but a world switch that's going from one OS to the other OS running, then we would have to update the MME with all of the information to the other world. And so the type one hypervisor would be involved with that as well. But yes, we've had this ability to do it in hardware uh, since the Nehalem architecture. So I want to say I was playing around with Nehalem prior to release in about 2007. So that's pretty cool. All right. Now what about devices? Remember we talked about devices in this course as well? Well, how do you handle devices on a virtual machine? A device is an actual physical thing. I have a keyboard. It attaches to my crappy little surface here. Here's a device. If I push a key on this keyboard, to which operating system does that interrupt go? Does that interrupt go to the host operating system or does it go to the guest operating system? Who gets the letters I push? And if a package arrives, if a packet arrives on a network adapter, to which OS does that go? So there are lots of different things that you can actually do. There is the ability to do this thing called pass-through, which is the idea of you take the device and you're going to assign it to one of the uh, VMs. And then any interrupts that arrive at that, from that particular device, they will be directed specifically to the VM which that device has been assigned to. So that's a pretty easy solution. Um, now what's interesting is when we're doing this, we want to make sure that the other operating systems don't get bothered by it. So if I push, if this keyboard is assigned to my VM, my first VM, let's say my first VM is running Windows 3.1, I want to make sure that my other VM, which is asleep, does not get woken up by me pushing these keys. So we want to make sure that whenever we're doing pass-through, or anything like that, that we are isolating the devices from other VMs. We don't want them to impact the VMs they are not uh, being associated with. Because uh, that would be really bad. Now, in order to do all of this, we actually do need hardware support, which obviously we have nowadays. But uh, looking back about 15, 20 years ago, we did, which is another reason why we've only been doing this very recently. So there are lots of solutions. All right, so why do we use these suckers? Aside from serving as a nice review of all the topics that we've obviously covered this time, processes and virtual memory devices, why do we use a VM? Well, there's lots of reasons. Uh, you used one in this course so that you could run an operating system on a piece of hardware that is long since deprecated and doesn't really exist anymore, and that's the MIPS R2000. So this actually, a VM gives us the ability to write code for other architectures that we may not actually have a physical version of. And if you've ever done iOS development, what did you think you were doing? You had to use a simulator, a form of virtual machine, in order to actually test that iOS app out. Um, so that's a really good reason to have one. Now, what I tend to use VMs for is I like to have uh, multiple operating systems running on the same machine at the same time because some of my work needs to happen in Windows, unfortunately. Some of my work needs to happen in Linux, and that's the majority of it. And other pieces of my work need to happen in Mac OS X. And I don't want to have a separate machine that I have to cart around for each of those things. And believe me, I actually used to do that. I used to carry around with me a Linux machine, a Mac, and a Windows machine. I was carrying around about 30 pounds of computing equipment, and it sucked, okay? With a VM, I can carry one machine, and I have access to all of those operating systems, all of it. Um, now, other reasons why you might do it. Let's suppose you wanted to write a piece of code that perhaps was a bit nefarious in nature, and you don't want to infect or harm your own computer. That's what a VM is for. VMs are supposed to be isolated from the host operating system, the host hardware, so it gives you an environment to write potentially harmful code without harming your own system. And then once you're convinced it works, you release it into the wild, right, and let it harm everybody else's systems. 
just not you. But that's also a really good reason to have a VM on your computer is let's say you are trying to get some program and it doesn't, uh, you're, you've gotten it off BitTorrent or the Whereas website, so you know it's full of viruses, but you're like, I really need this program, what am I going to do? Okay, put it in a VM and who cares? It's isolated from your host machine, so it shouldn't be able to infect it. I mean, you can disable things like the network and so on to make sure of that. So it actually gives you a safe way of testing software you think it might have uh, viruses. Now, another thing that this is good for is resource utilization. So how many of you have ever used one of these cloud services? But a few of you, that's good. So that actually didn't start out as some, let's share our computing resources with the world. That's not how that started. Companies weren't trying to be nice to you. Uh, one of the ways that Amazon AWS actually got started was right around this time of year, Black Friday, you know, the holidays, they realized in order to support the amount of traffic they were getting on their website, they needed to add additional infrastructure. More web servers, more disks, more power in order to uh, make sure that all of their customers were getting the right level of service uh, when they were visiting the Amazon website. But what happens in the middle of summer? Nobody was using all these additional resources that they had purchased. So Amazon had this idea. <laughs> Could we rent it out? Could we let people run VMs on our servers and charge them money for it? Because that would let us take resources that are currently sitting idle and still make some money back on it. And it took off and it was massively successful to the point where now Amazon is building almost their data centers for this purpose alone. And, uh, by the way, if you are curious and you want to try out, I don't know about the other two. I've never used Google's or Microsoft's. Uh, but Amazon does have a free tier, and uh, it's try. It's it's actually pretty good. You can even get up to like tiers that give you like GPUs for like two bucks an hour. So if you ever want to write code and not hurt your own computer, you can either get free time or pay for time on Amazon and hurt theirs, right? <laughs> so the story goes with that. So I have a bad habit of setting my computers on fire. Graphics, GPUs get hot, things catch on fire. So I started actually using Amazon to do it because I didn't want to set another one of my home machines on fire. And if you're thinking I'm joking, I'm not joking. I literally did set one on fire. I, I had flames shoot up from the keyboard. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> that's not the only one that's gone down by heat damage, but um, so I used Amazon one day, and half an hour after I finished my run, and it was a big run, I think I was using 20 of their, uh, tes their, um, their GPU models, and I think they were the NVIDIA Teslas, and half an hour after my run finished, the exact data center that I was using had a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and it went down. And the, somebody else in my lab had to tell me all about it, and they're like, they, they didn't know I had been using it, like just before I had it, and they asked me, was it you? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then I looked, I, I looked it up and I was like, no, no, I was done about half an hour before then, but then you start asking yourself, was it me? <laughs> yeah. But it, hey, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to maintain it, so who cares, right? All right, so with that, that is actually the official end of the course material. And so the remaining like 50 minutes, I figured let's do some final exam review, right? Because I'm guessing based on the midterm average, you're all absolutely terrified for the final. I don't know, I don't play that game. And besides, the final's worth a lot less than it used to be. Previous terms, I think it was worth like 45%. I, I think it's like 35 or something now. All right. So, in terms of final exam review stuff, yeah. Could 
That one? What do you have? There are no sample finals. I'm not offering any. <laughs> but you have all of the midterms to do your pre-midterm studying with. And then remember that off the same page where you access the midterms, we also have a sample review questions. And they cover the entire course. If you see something like the word nachos in the question, avoid it. We haven't used nachos in probably 15 years. It's the OS I used when I took this course. Um, so there's lots of material there. Uh, there's also on Piazza, if you haven't seen my extra lecture note thread, I've updated it. It now includes the device math and it also includes a brief guide for file systems. Um, there's all kinds of guides. They include all of the formulas that I've given you and examples of using the formulas. So hopefully that will be uh, helpful. The final exam is significantly heavy towards the post midterm content because everything that came before the midterm, not only have you had you know an exam on it already, but all of the assignments were on pre midterm content as well. So expect this to be heavy on. Um, Things like multi-level paging, and devices, and scheduling, and file systems. Very, very heavy on that. I always get asked, what's the split? I don't know. I didn't look. <laughs> I don't have time for that. Write the exam, and then you can tell me on Piazza afterward, right? Uh, all right. And you don't get a calculator for the exam, but I would, seriously, if you're not accustomed to doing uh, hexadecimal calculations on your own. I practiced that before the exam. Because you know virtual memory and all that. And uh, if there are other forms of calculations on the exam, it's okay to leave them in a fractional format so long as it's simplified and the units are clearly stated. Um, otherwise, it will be difficult to grade. Any questions about the final exam in general? Yeah? What's the format? Is this similar to what You bet it is. It's exactly like the midterm because I took the midterm latex file and I bought it. <laughs> so yes, it looks a lot like the midterm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. To be fair, my networking class's final exam looks like the OS final exam because I took the OS latex and I used that to do the networking. <laughs> Get to reuse things, right? <laughs> All right. So I do have official review slides, but I thought before we get into them, I've got one more of these, and it's my favorite one. Okay, it's not. Every, it's never you guys' favorite one. It's always just me that likes this one. I don't know. I think it's easy. Uh, All right. So this is a good review problem for uh, file systems, and it's reviewing both the logical file system and the physical file system. So I'll hand this out, and I'll give you maybe eight minutes or so to think about it. Use the, the file system guide that's provided online if you can't remember the formulas to do this. Um, my recommendation to you is you need to figure out first how much data can be accessed by each part of this iNode? Like how much data is accessed from the direct pointer, how much data is accessed from a single indirect, and so on and so forth. Figure that out first, and then you'll find the rest of the problem easier. <coughs> 
And you should assume that the cache is initially empty.
everyone else's favorite, but it's always my favorite. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is figure out the memory that is accessible in this file system. So we need to know how many uh, pointers can fit into a block. We need to know from each direct pointer how much memory we can access from the single indirect pointer, how much memory we can access, and so on and so forth. Because we need to know when we do the read and write operation, from where in the files, in the physical files, am I, act, am I actually doing that read or write from so I know how many blocks I need to read or write. So we start off by breaking down the inode. So we have nine direct pointers. And um, each of those pointers has one kilobyte. So that is nine times 1,024 bytes. So that's nine kilobytes. And if you were to look at it, that's roughly from, and this is going to come in handy later, that's roughly from byte zero to one. Well, let's look at the wrong one, nine, two, one, six. Nope, my, that is not me misplacing my brackets. That's a range math. Uh, all right, so that's how much memory you can access from a direct pointer. Well, what about the single indirects? Well, because of the single indirect, we need to know how many pointers can you fit in a block. The so number of pointers per block. 
Well, if each pointer is four bytes, which is the default size, and you have 1,024 bytes in block, then you have 256 pointers per block. So, for my single indirect, I can access 256 times 1 kilobytes. So, that's 256 kilobytes. And then for my double, which doesn't actually come into play here. That would be 256 squared times 1 KB. It's about 65 and change megabytes. We don't need to worry about that right now. All right. So now I kind of see the ranges here. Um, I'm going to write down the rough range for the bytes that we can access from the single indirect pointer. That's going to be from 92162271360. Now, I might have this number off by a factor, and if I do, I apologize, but it's not going to come into play. All right. So that's the first part. Now we know the layout of our inode. Now we can actually look at the problem itself, which has three operations. We are going to seek, and then we are going to write, and then we are going to read. We seek to byte 10,500. How many disk operations happen for that operation? How many of you say zero? How many of you say one? How many of you are not sure? The answer is zero, none. Seek does not touch the disk at all. The only thing that Seek does is go into the processes, file descriptor table, and change the current position in the file to 10,500. It does not validate it. For our file, it's fake, so it's fine. It works out. Now, then, so my pointer is now at byte 10,500, where I do a read or sorry, not a read, a write of 1,000 bytes. So I am going to write from byte 10,500 to byte 11,500. So in order to figure out how many reads and writes are going to happen, I need to figure out where is byte 10,500. Yep. Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> All right. So 10,500 is not in this range right here, which means that I'm not accessing it by a direct pointer. It, 10,500 is pretty close to this, definitely falls within this range, which means I'm going through a single indirect. So the next question I have to ask is, how many data blocks am I going to have to read? And in order to do that, let's actually take a look at the single indirect block. So we have, this is our pointer block, and we have a bunch of pointers here to data. Now, my first pointer, this is pointing to bytes 9216 to 10,240. So that's not ours. That's not the one we're going to use. The next one goes from 10 to 40, 11 to 6, 4, and then 11 to 6, 4, 12,288. Sorry, I'm wrong at a few extras because we're going to need them. And then 12, 288, 1, 3, 3, 1, 2. Right. So we've drawn out the first few ranges accessible from each of those indirect pointers. Okay, where is 10,500? It's in here. So that's the start of my right. The end of my right is 11,500, which is not in this block. It is in this block. So my right 
starts here, and my right ends in the next block. And now I have all of the information that I need in order to figure out how many reads and writes are going to happen in order to actually do this right of a thousand bytes. So, what are they? I am going to read the I know. Then I'm going to read the pointer block. Then I am going to read two data blocks. I'm going to label them B and C. So this is pointing to A, this is pointing to B, C, and D. Then I am going to write two data blocks. I'm writing B and C, and then I write the I know. So, one I know read, one I know write, and then I have five data block read and write. All right, does that make sense to everyone? In order to do this, make sure you actually lay it out. Yep. Because we're writing all from the middle of the data block. Oh. And we can't do a partial write oh. or a partial read. So we have to read the whole block in before we can update part of it. Okay. Yep. So, if we are overwriting the entire block, there's no reason to read it in. Yeah. That would be pointless. So, if we have a CD, we have read C. That's right. Now that comes down to specific file system implementation, but in my, it, for us, if you are overwriting the entire block, don't read it in first. It doesn't make sense. Yep. So why do we write the I know at the very end? Do we end up like extending the file size or something? Yes. Uh, so it's not that we extend the file size in this example. We modify the file. So we have to update the modified timestamp inside of the I know. All right. So, after we've done this, oh, one more question in the back there. Wait, so what's happening with the reads with a pointer block? Because they read the single direct. Do we have to read two more like direct ones? So, when we read in the pointer block, that is the block of pointers to the other data blocks. So, we're reading in this block here. And then from here, we figure out that we need to get data blocks B and C. And then this here is reading in B and C. So we've, already, we've got that all in there. All right. Now after doing this, our cache started out as empty. We fill it back up again with all of these things. And then we're going to do a read operation of 1,000 bytes. Now remember that file access is sequential. So where the write left off is where the read will continue from. So the read starts at byte 11,500 and goes to byte 12,500, which means that my read starts here and my read ends there. Now, everything that we've done so far has been cached. The inode is in the inode cache, the pointer block is in the data block cache, and blocks B and C are in the data block cache. So when I go to do my read operation, I look in my cache and I find the inode. Hey, I don't have to do anything, this is great. And then I look, I realize I need the pointer block. And oh, look, it's in my data block cache, so I didn't have to do anything there. I grabbed it from the cache. So we do a read of the inode, but it's from cache. And I read the pointer block from cache. So these don't count as IO operations because they're coming from the cache. And then I'm going to, I need to start my read from data block.
block C. So I get three data block C, and that's in the cache. But data block D is not in the cache, so I have to do read data D, and this one is from disk. So this is an I.O. here. The last thing that I have to do is also an I.O. operation. I have to write the I.O. to disk. Why do I have to write the I.O. to disk? Because I just accessed the file data and I need to update the access time. So the number of I.O. operations for the read is just two. Everything else happens from the cap. All right. We've got 20 minutes left, so if you have any more questions, by all means, stop by office hours to ask me about this problem. I do know that it does trip up a lot of people, and if you've ever been in my office, you know that I actually have the solution to this like permanently on the board, uh, because I have to answer questions about it every term, so it just kind of lives there. So what I'd like to do then, with the remaining time, we have some review slides, which are posted, by the way, and we're not going to get through all of them, but let's take a look at some of them. There's like 44 of them, by the way. Yep. Pardon? The inode cache? Yes, we are using the inode cache. All right. Yep. Then you don't have to read before you write, yeah. All right. So, some additional review work. Most of this, by the way, focuses on the post, uh, post midterm stuff. So, for what reason might a process fail to open a file? So, how many of you say that if the file does not exist, the process will fail to open a file? What do I mean by fail? Open returns an error code. How many of you say if the file doesn't exist, that would be an error? Obviously. <laughs> Yep. Yes, it's usually a flag to create, and a lot of a lot of file systems there would be a, there would be a flag for that. So, what if the user process that's trying to open the file does not have the correct permissions? How many of you say that's an error? Obviously, because you can't open each other's files across user accounts. All right, what about the file name format is incorrect? And if you're confused as to what I mean by that, the FAT16 file system, which we talked about, um, only supports file names that are eight characters long with a three character extension. And if you go download a file off BitTorrent today, let's say you found a copy of Star Wars there, uh, how many characters are in the BitTorrent file names? Like 200? Because they've got to put the movie file name the weird handles of the eight people that stole it. Uh, you know. You, I know you know. <laughs> so if I try to take that 200 character file name and save that file on a FAT16 file system, does it work? It doesn't work. Because the file system does not support file names of that type or with squiggly lines and exclamation marks and all of that garbage. So that was an error. What about the file is empty? How many of you say that's an error? Anyone say there's no error? There's no error. There's nothing wrong with an empty file. It exists. There doesn't have to be data in it. So obviously that one's fine. By the way, all the answers are in these slides, so. All right, so remember that we did some stuff with disk math? So take a couple minutes here. 
play with this disc here, we've got an old school 5400 RPM disc, uh, two to the power of 10 tracks, and two to the power of 32 bytes total capacity, so it's a 4 gig disc. And uh, we want to know the capacity of the track, the sector, uh, how long it takes to do a full rotation, how long it takes to transfer 10 data blocks, and how long does it take to move uh, the read-write head 400 tracks away. So take a couple minutes. If you're looking for the formulas, by the way, they are uh, on Piazza, but you should memorize them. <laughs>
If you are finding this math a little difficult, again, I can't stress enough, there is a guide to all these formulas with examples <coughs> closer to Piazza. Go through it. All right. Here's another fun one I love, and we'll all go through this one. We want to enumerate the dis operations to execute ls user bin local. And if you're not familiar with ls, I don't know where you have been the last three years of your career. Um, I've seen it though, I have seen it. Um, ls is going to list everything that is in the directory user bin local. So if we do this, let's go over it. We start by reading roots inode, which gives us the pointer to roots data. And it's in roots data where I will find the i number for user. Then I'm going to read user's inode. And that will give me the pointer to user's data, which I will then read user's data to find the i number for bin. I read bin's i node. And then bin's data, and in bin's data, I get the i number for local. I read local's i node, and then I finally read local's data. Now in ls, we are going to list all of the files that are in that directory, which is really just dumping the contents of the directory, i.e. dumping all of the hard links onto the screen, but not listing their i numbers, just actually, you know, the file names. So then what we're going to do is we read local's data block, but we don't touch any of the files inside. And we don't have to touch any of the files inside local because ls on its own just prints the names of the files that are contained in the directory, and all of that information is actually just in the hard links that are in that directory for local. Yeah. Would you have enough files in a directory so you need to use a name directory? Yes, that is possible that you would have, if you, let's say, you know, when you were eight years old, you might have downloaded everything to, like, the downloads folder. <laughs> yeah, me too. Too busy. <laughs> So yes, it is, in this case, in this course, we've always assumed that the directory uses a single data block for the hard links. It is totally valid that the directory could use multiple data blocks for the hard links. We're assuming it does. Right. Now, how would this change if instead of saying ls, I said ls-la? Would it be the same number of reads? Nope. Actually, I'm going to go with you. That's right. So what we would have to do is because the ls-la is going to show us the permissions, the creation times, the owners, and the size of all those files, which is only contained in the inodes of those files, if we do ls-la, in addition to all of this, I also have to read every inode for every file contained in that directory. It's a lot of work. And if you're ever sitting there wondering, why does my disk light flash like an idiot? Yeah, that's why. <laughs> All right. This is a boring one. Let's skip that. Well, there's like 44 of these, okay? Ah, this is a fun one. Let's skip it. <laughs> why did I skip it? Uh, because I gave a weird answer. Uh, and we've only got like six minutes. So here's another fun one. Remember, this is a topic you probably forgot we even covered. It's called scheduling. Uh, <laughs> it's totally fair game for the exam. Wait, wait. <laughs> uh, all right, so Linux is completely fair scheduled. We covered it at a very, very high level. So I've got two threads. And the total thread rate in the system is 100. I've given you the thread rates for A and B, which are the only ones we are concerned with. I've given you their actual run times. And you need to tell me which one goes next. Is it going to be A that's going to run or B that's going to run? Remember that you're calculating the virtual runtime. 
as the actual runtime multiplied by the total thread weight in the system divided by your thread weight. And then you choose the thread that has the lower virtual runtime to go next. The total thread weight changes. Yeah, yeah. It's not good. Yeah, for this point, it's changing. Let me cancel that. All right, how many of you say A? How many of you say B? How many of you are like, I don't remember this shit at all, I'm lost? <laughs> Fair enough. Calculate the virtual runtime for A. It's 5 times 100 over 10 gives you 50. <coughs> virtual runtime for B. 10 times 100 over 11 gives you 90.9. So the answer is A. A goes next. By the way, there's an example of this in the scheduling notes, if you've forgotten it. And don't forget this thing called multi-level feedback cues. Yeah, we covered that too. That's always a fun one. Because that's used by like everybody except Linux, right? All right. So speaking of multi-level feedback cues, so if you remember that, because obviously you forgot the scheduling was part of this course, you have multiple priority cues. And each, the highest priority queue, we're always going to choose from the highest priority queue that has a thread. And if you are running and you get preempted, you don't go onto the back of the queue you came off of, you go down to the next lower priority queue. So the question is, in this system as we described it just now, is there starvation? Yes, there is. How do you fix it? I hear somebody saying move everything to the top, and that is the answer. So what multi-level feedback cues does in order to prevent starvation, which happens because threads always trickle down, is to make sure they get a chance to come back up and run again. Periodically, we take every thread and we put it back at the top. And let it trickle down again. And Solaris did this once per second. So it did happen quite, quite often. All right, let's do one more. This is a good one. So we have a prankster. Every piece of software that exists has an Easter egg in it. Uh, Microsoft Excel, for the longest time, had a flight simulator in it. I don't know if it still does. I never actually knew how to run it, but I've seen people do it. Um, even movies have Easter eggs in them. That's a fun one. Uh, and uh, things that the director doesn't know about, by the way. <laughs> so let's suppose you are working for Microsoft, and while you are working there, you added your own system call, such that if you type this OS sucks in the command line, it executes a system call exception, goes into the kernel, and these every semaphore. <laughs> Now the question isn't what is the consequence of doing that, the question is would you actually be able to V all those semaphores? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? The answer is yes because semaphores don't have owners, which means anyone can V them. Now not to mention if you did this, the very, very, very bad things are going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the NSA did this to Windows, I don't know. If you didn't know that the NSA has a backdoor in Windows 10, it's pretty well known. I'm sure they've had it into every OS. <laughs> All right. There's device drivers, don't forget that. There's a sample problem in here for that. Uh, clock replacement algorithm is also in here. Multi-level paging, but I'm going to end on this one. OS161 has raised an exception, a panic. TLB miss on load. EPC is that value there, and the virtual address 
was that? What happened? First off, what code was running? What code was running? It's the kernel. We know that because that is a kernel virtual address for the EPC. What was I trying to read from? No. How should my operating system handle this panic? It should die. The operating system is not a user process. So if the operating system experiences a segmentation fault, it should, what, what, what are you going to kill? It, it kills itself. So obviously you should panic and die. All right. One last thing before we go. So there are much more problems in here. Don't forget the quiz that is today. Uh, I will announce my office hours for later in the term. I hope you've had an okay journey through OS, and uh, we'll see you at the exam or something.